reading verses 1 through 4 and getting into our study, Job chapter 18. Then Bildad the Shuhite answered and said, How long till you put an end to words? Gain understanding, and afterward we'll speak. Why are we counted as beasts and regarded as stupid in your sight, you who tear yourself in anger? Shall the earth be forsaken for you? Thank you, Bildad. That was very kind of you. It's a nice way to begin. And you shouldn't do that because, after all, you are the shortest man in the Bible. You are shoe height. But with that said, I did that on purpose. I knew you've heard that before, so there. Okay, Job has just asked a question. Job had had a question in chapter 17 at verse uh, 15. He said, where then is my hope? As for my hope... Who can see it? As for my hope, who can see it? What hope do I have? What hope can you offer me? As for any hope offered to me, the things that are being promised will never come to pass. The things that you say will never happen. You see, what we're seeing here at this point is uh, in the midst of his incredible pain, And in the midst of his frustration, Job has now lost hope. He's despairing, if you will. He's despairing of hope. Now, when we speak of hope, and the hope that he's speaking about, obviously, but when we speak of hope, many look at the word hope or the concept of hope as what others might just simply call wishful thinking. But the Bible doesn't teach that hope is wishful thinking. The Bible teaches us, especially in the Christian understanding of hope, is that hope is really what would be called confident expectation. Uh, This confidence that we have is built on our relationship to Jesus Christ, and Jesus Christ is our hope. Jesus Christ is the foundation of our hope. He is our hope. He is what has been called our, our blessed hope. He's the one that we have full confidence in. He's the one that we can trust. So in the New Testament sense of hope, when we, when we read of hope, we, we see that it, it, it is really what would be called confidence. It's, it's not that, gee, I wish or somehow it could. No, it's a confidence that it will, that God will do what God has said. And Jesus Christ is the one who is the author of our hope. He's the one that our hope is centered on. And again, I mentioned he is also referred to in Scripture as our blessed hope. I, I didn't put this in my notes, so you're not going to see it on the screen But in uh, the book of Titus, in chapter 2, verses 11 following to verse 14, uh, Paul said, The grace of God that brings salvation has appeared to all men, teaching us that denying ungodliness and worldly lusts, we should live soberly, righteously, and godly in the present age. And then he said, verse 13 of chapter 2 of Titus, looking for the blessed hope, and glorious appearing of our great God and Savior, Jesus Christ, who gave himself for us, that he might redeem us from every lawless deed and purify for himself his own special people, zealous for good works, looking for the blessed hope. Jesus Christ is our hope. Very often when we see that term, looking for the blessed hope, we consider the blessed hope to be what we we have uh, called the rapture, but The blessed hope is not simply uh, something that is going to take place, not simply the event of, but the blessed hope really is Jesus himself. So our hope is deposited in him because he is our hope and he is our blessed hope. And because we have this hope, we can have confidence. Because we have this hope, we know that what he has said, he will do. Now, it doesn't always appear that he will. I have to be honest with you. There are times when I've wondered, Lord, Will you do what you say you're going to do? Will you actually do that? Because sometimes I can lose hope, and I've been walking with the Lord for a long time, and I can begin to wonder, Lord, are you really going to do what you say? I was sharing with John just the other day how that the Lord began to teach me at a very early Christian age that he answers prayer. And I was sharing with him an illustration, something that was very foundational in my own walk with the Lord, that had taken place when I was a young man. I was 20 years old, and uh, I had gone into the military, was in the army, 
we were going through basic training, and several friends of, of mine and I decided when we got a, a weekend off to go home. And when we were up in, uh, in uh, uh, Fort Ord, up by Monterey, and uh, one of the guys had a car. He had a, a nine, I think it was a 1956 Buick, a big old car. And so we were able to fill it up with several of us. There were, I think, three guys in the front, maybe four in the back seat, I forget. And we started driving south because all of us lived in the southern portion of, of uh, California, Southern Cal. And as we were driving home, we were driving from Monterey, and I was telling John about this. I, I, I shared with him now that, well, 50 years ago, uh, the highways and all aren't what they are now. They, they, were, they were actually like two or four lanes, and that was about it. And so we were coming down. It was actually two lane. We were 10 miles uh, north of uh, Santa Maria. And as we were coming down uh, towards uh, the south, going towards Santa Maria, I was sharing with him how the car broke down. And so it, you know, uh, what an amazing thing. A 1956 Buick broke down. And, and so we pull over to the side of the road. And as we're on the side of the road, there's nothing we can do. And it's starting to, uh, to grow dark. And there's nothing there. There's just, at that point, it was just a two lane. There's nothing there. And I think, oh, great. You know, here we are. We're stuck here. We're outside of Santa Maria. We still have, you know, 100 plus miles to go over, 100 miles to go to get home. I was on my way to Norwalk. We had a friend of ours who was on his way to Huntington Beach. And we thought, how is this going to happen? There's no traffic here. You know, and I got concerned. And so I went to the side of the road there and and two of my friends who actually owned the car, the guy who owned the car and his, his, his best friend were there, and they were going to stay and try and get the car running, and the rest of us were going to hitchhike and see if we could get home. And so I went and I, I remember sticking my thumb out to try and catch a ride. And when I did that, my friend Bill said to me, wait a minute, we're Christians, let's ask God. We're his children. God answers prayer. So I said, well, yeah, that's cool. I'm a brand new Christian. Maybe he will. Let's see what happens. I'm willing to take a try. So I remember we held hands, you know, Bill and I. We were the only Christians there. All the rest of the guys were not believers. And so Bill and I and these guys said, we're going to pray. And, and I remember the prayer was a real simple one. Jesus, please help us. We want to go home. Help us. That was it. And so we got all excited. What's God going to do? You have to understand there's no traffic. And so... We thought, well, we might as well start walking towards Santa Maria until the prayer is answered. Let's put some feet to our prayers. And so we started walking. And as God is my witness, we didn't walk 40, 40 meters, you know, 50 yards. We, did, we didn't walk that far. When we, we hear the sound of a car coming towards us, it's a Volkswagen. It's a young girl and her little brother. And they pull over on the side of the road now, you got to figure there's six or seven men on the side of the road, 10 miles outside of Santa Maria, and a young girl, about 16 or 17, pulls over. That's stupid. So she pulls over, and her, her little brother rolls the window down, and this is what she said. I'll never forget. She says, I don't know why I'm doing this. I'm a Christian, and God just told me to pull over and give you a ride. And so we got all excited. So we put our pagan friends in, in the car. <laughs> it's true. So one sat here and three sat there. There was three of us somewhere. So that's how many there were all together. And so she says, I'm going to drive to Santa Maria. I'm going to drop them off, these guys off, at, uh, at the bus station. I'll come back, and if you're still here, I'll give the rest of you a ride to Santa Maria. Now, we're rejoicing in the Lord because when she said, I'm a Christian, my friend Bill and I said, so are we. You just answered our prayer. So, you know, you could say, oh, oh praise God, I'm not pulling over, pulling over for a bunch of escaped convicts. And so now I'm excited because God just did something. And as God is my witness, we began to walk and a Volkswagen van, a hippie limousine pulls over. And when the van pulls over, the guy rolls down his window and he says, you guys need some help. You need a ride. And so we said, yeah, we do. So we had a friend named Mike Feeney. Mike Feeney was on his way to Huntington Beach. Bill and I were on our way to Norwalk. So we told these guys, again, 10, 10 miles outside of Santa Maria, 
we said, this is where we're going. And the guy says, hop in, I can take you. So there we go. And I, Bill and I climb into the back. And it was, you know, it was a hope. It was, you know, it, it, there was a bed. It was like a bed. So we were able to just kind of lay down. And the guy, there was a guy back there. And he was a Christian. So this Christian guy, Bill and I, fellowship until we fell asleep. My friend Mike, who was a pagan, the, the guy driving was a pagan, so they talked pagan. But, and, and he pulls over in Norwalk, a half mile from where Bill and I lived, pulled over and said, see you guys later. Thanks a lot. And we said, thanks a lot. And he took Mike all the way to his doorstep because they were on their way to Huntington Beach. And see, that's when the Lord began to teach me. And he, he has to teach me over and over. It's not like I learned forever, I know. No, it's, it, it, your, your lessons very often are, okay, I'm teaching you something now, but you're going to forget. So I'm going to teach you again. You're going to forget. And he's been teaching me things for 50 years about how good he is so that I could one day have confidence in my God, so that I could hear his voice when he speaks, and so I could know that he's moving. And he's done it so many times in so many ways. I'm sure that all of us have our own stories of how God met us in a special place at a special time when nothing else was going to happen that, that we thought was good. But God said, no, I'm going to be here and I'll show you what I can do. He's done that so many times with me. So many times. And yes, my lessons have to be learned more than once like everybody else's. I have to relearn and relearn. He is faithful, but he has always given me confidence. He's always, and that's hope, confidence in God. My hope is in the Lord. And, and the Christian understanding of hope is that expectation. And it, it's built on not our, our attempts to be good. It's built on the reality that he's good and he keeps his word. And so we have a strong hope because we trust in Jesus and Jesus does the work on our behalf. Remember, he has conquered death, and he's the one who has brought us into his kingdom. In the book of Hebrews, in chapter 2, verses 14 and 15, the writer says, since the children have flesh and blood, he too shared in their humanity, so that by his death, he might destroy him who holds the power of death, that is, the devil, and free those who all their lives were held in slavery by their fear of death. God has set us free from the fear of death. O oh, death, where is thy sting? O oh, grave, where is thy victory? You see, the Lord has given to us this hope, this knowledge, and it's a continuing hope. It's one that doesn't fade away because it's rooted in Jesus Christ. In 1 Peter 1 verse 3, Peter wrote, Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, According to his great mercy, he has caused us to be born again to a living hope through the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead. Now, obviously, here in the book of Job, as Job is beginning to lose hope, Job lived long before Jesus came, and therefore he doesn't have the kind of hope that he didn't have the kind of hope that we have. For him, hope was something that, uh, that he could lose easily. And this is what he's doing at this point. As we've been looking at this book, he's just simply losing his hope. To begin to lose hope is a great loss. We need to trust in the Lord. We need to remain steadfast in him. Because in many ways, we know that hope is the only tie that keeps the heart from breaking. And so we as believers need to keep our eyes firmly on the Lord. Remember this, he has never failed us. And he never will. In Psalm 33, verses 16 through 21, no king is saved by the size of his army. No warrior escapes by his great strength. A horse is a vain hope for deliverance. Despite all its great strength, it cannot save. But the eyes of the Lord are on those who fear him, on those whose hope is in his unfailing love to deliver them from death and keep them alive in famine. We wait in hope for the Lord, for he is our help and our shield. 
in him our hearts rejoice, for we trust in his holy name. See, that's the cry of the believer. Our hope is in the Lord. We trust in him. And so we've been looking at that, and even as we had finished chapter 17, and, and Job had asked that question at verse 15, where is my hope? Well, this has caused Bildad to, to get a bit upset. And so Bildad answers and gives Job what we would see in Scripture as his second speech. Now notice how he begins. He begins with an insult. How long till you put an end to words? Gain understanding, and afterward we will speak. So he begins with an insult. Apparently he, he's tired of Job's lengthy speeches. He's irritated by the fact that Job isn't listening, and he's bothered because Job is, is treating their advice with contempt. So he asks the question in verse 2, how long will you speak these things? He's wanting to know, how long are you going to continue? How long will you, you speak these things? How long till you put an end to words? Gain understanding, afterward we will speak. How long are you going to speak like this? In other words, gain understanding. Think a little bit before you speak. Because if you think a little bit before you open your mouth, it'll, 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 uh, it'll be a good thing. Now, when he says, be slow to speak, that's really not bad advice. Let's, let's, let's admit to that. In, in the Proverbs, there's, the book of Proverbs has a lot of exhortation concerning learning to, to hold our peace, and to not be so quick to speak. In Proverbs 10, verse 19, when words are many, sin is not absent. He who holds his tongue is wise. Proverbs 13, verse 3, he who guards his lips guards his life, but he who speaks rashly will come to ruin. Proverbs 15, verse 2, the tongue of the wise commends knowledge, but the mouth of fools gushes folly. Proverbs 17, 27, a man of knowledge uses words with restraint, Men of understandings, even tempered. Again, this is one of those lessons that it took a while for the Lord to teach me. I don't know what you were like when you were growing up. I don't know what your home was like when you were growing up. Maybe you came from a very civil home, a very a home that that uh, ran in an orderly fashion where nobody really ever spoke and. And at the dinner table, you'd say, would you please pass the salt? And they'd say, well, of course. And they would hand it. Maybe that was your home. That wasn't mine. <laughs> we came, I came from a home where my mom pretty much spoke her mind whenever she wanted to. And, and I never saw anything wrong with that. I thought that's the way everybody is. You just speak your mind. And so I went into the Army, and I learned some lessons there about speaking my mind. You're not supposed to. I still remember I was standing in, in formation. Um, the company that I served in was uh, a little over 400 strong. And every morning from Monday through Friday, we would come out. We'd have to stand in formation. And we had sergeants in front of each one of the... Uh, we were broken into different groups. And we had sergeants and, and all of that. And they would kind of bellow out things to us. And so there's 400 of us. And, and the sergeant... Um, that was um, talking to us that day, said my name. He said, Rosales, you have extra duty this afternoon, which means I had done something that he didn't like. And I said, no, I don't. Now, I'm saying this in front of 400 people. And the sergeant says, you have extra duty, and you're going to be staying afterwards, and you're going to be working extra duty. And I said, no, I'm not. And he kind of looks at you, and you don't do that in the army, but I didn't know you don't, because I'm Rosales. He said, yes, you are. And I said, no, I'm not. And now he's not happy. Yes, you are. You're staying. I said, no, I'm not. So he says, go into my office. So in front of all these guys, I have to get out, and I have to walk into his office. And so I know what's going to happen. He's going to come in and bluster and try and scare me. And I'm not that guy. You don't do that. So I'm thinking, oh, boy, here we go. But the spirit, I was a new Christian, and the Spirit of the Lord spoke to me. And the Spirit of the Lord said, you are out of order. You should have been respectful. 
You should never have spoken to him that way. When he walks in the room, apologize. So he walks in, and he starts hitching his pants up, and he's going to go into that threatening thing. And I looked at him, and I said, before you say anything, I'm a Christian. The Holy Spirit just spoke to my heart and let me know that I was out of order, and I have to ask you for forgiveness. I'm sorry for speaking the way that I just did. He thought I was afraid of him. But, but to be real with you, I wasn't. I was more afraid of him, the Lord, because the Lord had spoken to my heart and had made it clear. Listen, I was only a few months old in the Lord. I came out of the world. I'm not used to people telling me what to do. The fact that God put me in the army, he had a lot to teach me, especially about following orders and discipline and and I wasn't the best soldier. I have friends that were great soldiers. I wasn't. I was the guy who wouldn't cut his hair. I was the guy who, I didn't, for two years, I didn't, I didn't iron my, my, my fatigues. I would ball them up and wear them all wrinkled. And, and, and it got on the people's nerves, and I liked it. I wanted to. I still remember walking by in the mess hall and the captain and the NCOs were all in one room and, and the rest of us were in a different room. And the captain, Captain Daniels, I was walking by with my tray and Captain Daniels said, Rosales. And I looked at him, he said, get in here. So I go walking in there with my tray and he points at me in front of all the sergeants and lieutenants and he says, this is what I'm talking about. I don't like this in my army. He's talking about me. And I'm thinking, gosh, I guess he doesn't like me. I'm not the model. Well, look at me. My shoes are all dirty. My fatigues are all messed up. I didn't care. I hadn't cut my hair. And he says, you have to cut your hair. And he says, you go and you get your hair cut today. That's an order. And then I pulled extra duty that time. Because you don't tell the captain you're not going to pull extra duty. I had a lot to learn. I had a lot to learn about being polite. I had a lot to learn about 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 just everything related to dying to self. And, and I really believe very strongly that God wanted to teach me something. He wanted to teach me to shut up, which was kind of hard because, then, like I said, it's true, you know. And we never even thought we were being rude. I didn't think I was being rude. You can ask my wife. When we married, I thought you would just tell your wife, hey, this is what I think. This is what you're going to do. This is how it's going to be. Talk to you later. You got any questions? I'm serious. I'm not. She's a saint. I'm serious. And she would just look at me. And I said, okay, then you understand, right? <laughs> and she would just look at me. She came from a quiet family. Her family thinks for a while before they speak. So I'd say, okay, it's settled, right? I'd go outside, true. I'd come walking in 30 minutes later. She'd say, listen, mister, we got to talk. And I'd look at her like, I thought this is settled, but it wasn't. So I had a lot to learn. I still do. A lot to learn. So see, I gave you a lot of scriptures about keeping your mouth shut because I'm talking to me. I'm, see, this, these are things that the Lord taught me. Keep your mouth shut. When words are many, sin is not absent. I don't always have to open my mouth. I don't have to always give my opinion. I don't have to always be right. I don't have to. It's okay if I'm not. I had to learn these things. So I'm basically preaching to me, and my wife is here. She'll repeat this later. <laughs> so what is Bildad saying? In effect, when you shut up and start to listen, we can talk. How long till you put an end to words, gain understanding, and afterward we will speak. And so, verse 3, why are we counted as beasts and regarded as stupid in your sight? You who tear yourself in anger, shall the earth be forsaken for you, or shall the rock be removed from its place? So he's responding to the many statements Job made. Now, remember, Job had said that they were forgers of lies. They were worthless physicians. He said that in chapter 13, verse 4. In chapter 16, verse 2, he had called them miserable comforters. 
In chapter 17, verse 10, he says, Please come back, all of you, for I shall not find one wise man among you. Well, because of this and other comments that he had made, Bildad responds, and he does it with a rebuke. He wants to know why they are counted as beasts. Now, when you read that, why do you count us as a beast? That, that is another way of saying, why are you calling us ignorant? Why are you calling us stupid? That's really what he's saying. In verse 4, when he, asks the question, or when he makes the statement, you who tear yourself in anger, shall the earth be forsaken for you? Remember in, in Job 16, verse 9, Job had said, he tears me in his wrath and hates me. Well, Bildad is saying, you tear yourself in anger. You're blaming God. You're the one responsible for your own problems. When he asks, shall the earth be forsaken? Shall the course of the world be altered to meet your wishes? And should that which is the most firm, speaking of a rock, alter its very nature for you? He said in verse 5, the light of the wicked indeed goes out and the flame of his fire does not shine. So the light of the wicked indeed goes out. In other words, what he has acquired of honor and prosperity or, or splendor, well, that will be taken from him. The light of the wicked goes out. The flame of his fire does not shine. In other words, not a single trace will remain. In Proverbs 13, verse 9, the light of the righteous rejoices, but the lamp of the wicked shall be put out. Proverbs 24, verse 20, for there shall be no reward to the evil man. The candle of the wicked shall be put out. So that's what Bildad is saying. In verse 6, the light is dark in his tent, and his lamp beside him is put out. Well, when it says the light is dark in his tent, that would mean his tent being his household. His entire household is going to be affected because the tent is a reference to his dwelling place. In, in other words, everything that he values will be lost. In verse 7, the steps of his strength are shortened and his own counsel casts him down. The steps of strength speaks of his ability to move about freely with confidence. And his own counsel are his plans. So his plans that he has made will lead to his downfall. So he will not be able to walk around with confidence, and he's actually going to see his plans fail, and the plans that he's made will lead to his failure. In Job 5, verse 12, remember it reads, he frustrates the devices of the crafty so that their hands cannot carry out their plans. So he continues on in verse 8. For he is cast into a net by his own feet. He walks into a snare. The, the net takes him by the heel. A snare lays hold of him. A noose is hidden for him on the ground and a trap for him in the road. So this speaks of snares and traps that are encircling him and, and, and capturing him. Uh, again, a minute ago he was saying he could once at one time walk around freely. He exercised control, but now voluntarily he's trapped. And he is unwisely walking into snares. Nets and nooses were used to capture unsuspecting animals. And so what's happening is he's being ensnared. In Psalm 9, verse 16, it says, The wicked is snared in the work of his own hands. And so he's speaking about him reaping what he's been sowing. In verse 11, he speaks in this way, Terrors frighten him on every side. Drive him to his feet. His strength is starved and destruction is ready at his side. It devours patches of his skin. The firstborn of death devours his limbs. He's uprooted from the shelter of his tent, and they parade him before the king of terrors. You're going to be surrounded by vague fears. These fears describe what anxiety produces in a person's life. Notice in verse 11 how he says, terrors frighten him on every side. The word terror speaks of fear. It speaks of panic. Panic shall nip at his heels. Panic will drive him into many anxious moments. In verse 12, it says his strength is starved. Destruction is ready at his side. So when it says his strength is starved, 
his strength is failing him. He becomes weak because fear can cause you to become weak. He feels like he's going to die. Destruction is ready at his side. He fears he's going to die. Notice verse 13. It devours patches of his skin. Devours patches of his skin can speak of the tumors, the, the filthy ulcers that he has. When it speaks concerning the firstborn of death, devouring his limbs, the word limbs don't speak just of that which is, has skin and, and sinew. It actually is speaking of his skeletal or his bones. It's speaking of his bones. When it says it devours patches of his skin, those are the tumors, and his bones are becoming brittle and being devoured. He, sp he speaks of the firstborn of death. The firstborn of death is an inter interesting phrase. Um, commentators that I use said that this may be speaking of the initial stages of dying. Or when it says the firstborn of death, they said, or it could be speaking of the worst of all diseases. But his body is growing sickly, and he's wasting away slowly. And, and, and what stood out, at, at, and I'm going to take you to another passage in a moment, but what, what, what stood out to me, and I was thinking of it just before I came out to teach tonight, tonight was in verse 11 when he says, terrors frighten him on every side and drive him to his feet. Terrors. In 1 John, and I'm going to turn my Bible there for a second. In 1 John chapter 4, listen to this, what it says in verses 17 and 18. 1 John 4, if you take notes, verses 17 and 18. Terrors, terrors frighten him on every side. The Bible says in 1 John chapter 4, verses 17 and 18, love has been perfected among us in this, that we may have boldness in the day of judgment, because as he is, so are we. In the world, there is no fear in love, but perfect love casts out fear because fear involves torment. But he who fears has not been made perfect in love. This scripture here, verse 18, 1 John chapter 4, if you take notes, you may want to note it and might want to memorize it. I want to share with you a little bit about that because it's something practical to me and it may not come out practically to you as I think about it. I hope I can help you to see the point that I'm making because Bildad is telling Job that he is surrounded by terror. And I think about that because in a practical way, many people today are surrounded by fear. It's motivating people to do all kinds of things. I was sharing uh, just this last week how my wife Marie and I, Marie's always trying to get me to take walks I'm that guy who doesn't want to. I don't like to, but Marie wants to. And so I always say, honey, go ahead. If you want to take a walk, go ahead, baby. I'll be waiting for you. But this last week, we took a bit of a walk. So she and I are walking, and I'm, I'm the reluctant traveler. She's the, you know, the happy wanderer. Me, I'm the reluctant traveler. And so we're walking down the street, you know, ball and chain, and Miss Walker. And we're looking up ahead of us, you know, uh, a block or so, half a block up. And on the corner here, we're on one side of the street. They're on the opposite side up at the corner. We see a man and his wife, I assume, and their dog. A, a, one of the little dogs, those little dogs. Uh, I don't know what you call them, worthless, but one of those dogs. <laughs> and, and they're walking towards us. They're about to cross the street to get on the same side of the street. Now, Marie and I aren't wearing masks. We're not wearing masks, and they are. I think they were wearing space suits. I mean, they're wearing masks. And so they stopped. It's kind of funny in some ways, but they stopped. And they're looking at us, and we're looking back at them. Marie's smiling, I'm just looking. And they go back. And I turned to Marie, and I said, I think they're afraid of us because we're not wearing masks. Now I'm tempted. I want to chase them. <laughs> now this is fun. 
And so they walk on the other side of the street. And, you know, they're giving us this look like, don't you care? Now, I, of course I do, but we've already had COVID. I'm not concerned about it at all. And even if I hadn't, I have to be honest, I wouldn't have been concerned anyway. You know, because I trip. I, okay, that's an old word. I should, I, I'm really, I, I don't know what, I don't know a good word that would, I trip out, I do. And I, I blow my mind at when people are driving by, driving by with all the windows up and they've got a mask on. I look at them. What are you doing? But that's the they, they feel safe, whatever, you know, feel safe, I, I guess. You know, I, I see them do that. I see them walking by themselves. They have their mask on. I think you're probably taking it further than you need to. But I respect the fact that you think that you're taking care of me or yourself. I respect that. I just don't understand it. No, I don't understand it when you drive by in the car with your mask and all the windows up. No, I don't. I don't understand it when you have a helmet and you have all that. No, I don't. I don't get it. Especially when I saw the same couple later on, <laughs> we were walking and they were coming towards us again, you know, and, and they've got a dog, but he's carrying the dog. And I'm thinking, what's wrong with you, man? That's got four legs. It should be carrying you. But that's another story. <laughs> what is, I don't want to live in bondage. I just don't. I, and I'm not going to, and I haven't. You see, fear has torment. Now, in context, what John is talking about in 1 John chapter 4 is the reason these people have torment is because they don't know the Lord. That's why they have torment. There's no fear in love, but perfect love casts out fear because fear involves torment. Is involved. They, they don't know that their security in Christ is solid because they're unsaved. And because they're unsaved, they are, they are driven by their fear. Why? Because they don't know what their future is. And so when he's speaking this way, uh, that's what he's referring to. When he says, love has been perfected among us in this, that we may have boldness in the day of judgment, because as he is, so are we in this world. That's what the clue is for what he's referring to in the next verse when he says there's no fear in love. What's he saying? He's saying that a believer, knowing where you're going, knowing your final destination is to be with Jesus Christ, when you have that confidence, you don't live in fear anymore. And as believers, we need to understand that today because I, I can't help but think that sometimes we, even as believers, have failed to understand that. He says fear has torment. Perfect love casts out fear. When you, when you are secure with the Lord, you're wise. You don't, you're not presumptuous. You don't, make, uh, you don't uh, tempt the Lord and all of the things that are quite obvious in Scripture that we're not to do. But you can live at peace. And, and that's what I didn't have when I didn't have Jesus. I didn't have peace. But when I came to know him, I came to know what peace is. Because perfect love casts out fear. Again, Job didn't have that. I'm turning back now. Job didn't have that kind of understanding. And so the one who doesn't have that kind of understanding, though it didn't really apply to Job, I have to be careful with this because what, what Bildad is doing is accusing Job of being a sinner, which Job is not. But again, the knowledge of our, our security and that God has written our names in the book of life, that comes in the New Testament. So Bildad is just telling him that if you don't have a, a, a faith and knowledge of God, your whole life is going to be one of fear. There are going to be nooses and traps for you. You're going to be walking in terror. But he's saying that to Job because he believes that Job, doesn't, that Job has sinned. And that's why his life is so messed up, which does not apply to Job. But in the New Testament sense, the reason I don't have to be walking in terror and being frightened on every side, uh, be weak with fear and all of that, is because I have a relationship with the Lord, and so do you. And because of that, we're not concerned the way that he is saying concerning Job. Now notice verse 14. He is uprooted from the shelter of his tent. They parade him before the king of terrors. They uproot 
him from the shelter of his tent. His home no longer brings shelter and safety. Ultimately, when it says they parade him before the king of, what is referring to the, uh, is, is that um, he is brought to death. The death he suffers is the worst that he could ever imagine for himself. So that's what Bildad is saying. He goes on and says in verse 15, they dwell in his tent who are none of his. Brimstone is scattered on his dwelling. His roots are dried out below. His branch withers above. The memory of him perishes from the earth. And he has no name among the renowned. He's driven from light into darkness, chased out of the world. He has neither son nor posterity among his people, nor any remaining in his dwellings. Those in the west are astonished at his day, as those in the east are frightened. Surely, such are the dwellings of the wicked. And this is the place of him who does not know God. So you see where he's going with all of this with Job. So when it says in verse 15, they dwell in his tent who are none of his, people are taking his property. It speaks of brimstone being scattered in his dwelling. Destruction replaces his prosperity. It's a picture really of destruction, the way that Sodom was destroyed and, and Gomorrah was destroyed with the picture of brimstone. In verse 16, when it says his roots are dried out below and his branch withers above, well, it speaks of a life that is, has, has, has no vitality. The psalmist, when he was speaking of the one who was blessed by God, gives us some insight into this. When he says in Psalm 1, verse 3, about the one who's walking with the Lord, he shall be like a tree planted by the rivers of water that brings forth its fruit in its season, whose leaf also does not wither, whatever he does shall prosper. And so Bildad is saying that Job is unrighteous, so he's going to be an unwatered tree. He's going to simply waste away. His life is going to dry up. He will produce no fruit. It even speaks concerning his children dying. In verse 17, the memory of him perishes from the earth. He will die, and no one will even know that he ever lived. Now, in the Jewish way of thinking, in the, in the Middle Eastern as well as the Jewish way of thinking, there are very few things that uh, bring you greater dishonor than to die and nobody know that you existed. In Proverbs 10, verse 7, it says, We have happy memories of the godly, but the name of the wicked person rots away. So every person wanted to leave something behind to be known of. We call it a legacy today, but they wanted to have a legacy. He's saying you won't have a legacy. The memory will, your memory will perish from the earth. And so in verse 18, it says he's driven from light into darkness. He's chased out of the world. When it says he'll be driven from light, light representing blessings and prosperity, and then he says into darkness, it could be a picture of the darkness of adversity. So he's going to be driven from blessing into adversity. It also speaks of being driven from the light of the living to the darkness of death, because darkness itself would be the grave. Or it could even be speaking of something further than that. He'll be driven into eternal darkness as opposed to being in God's presence. Remember in Matthew 25, verse 30, Jesus said in one of his stories, cast the unprofitable servant into outer darkness. There will be weeping and gnashing of teeth. And so this has a variety of meanings. In verse 19, it says, he, he has neither son nor posterity among his people, nor any remaining in his dwellings. His family will be cut off. He'll have no children to carry on his name or to carry on his memory. That would be taken very personally by Job, who had 10 children die. That's a very low blow for him, very low blow. Because he's inferring, just like you, Job, I'm making a point. You're a sinner. You're denying so many things. Well, you need to remember that the wicked don't have children. He has neither son nor posterity amongst his people, none remaining in his household. Your family will be cut off. And that must have cut to the heart. 
Those in the West are astonished at his day, as those in the East are frightened. Surely such are the dwellings of the wicked. And this is the place of him who does not know God. When it says those in the West are astonished, his, his fate will alarm all who see what is happening to him. And it's going to stand out as a warning to others. It's going to become a proverb. It's going to be a warning. <laughs> Interestingly enough, and we're about to close with this, Job did become an example. And he did become a model. But not for being a sinner. Job is remembered as a model of a righteous man. In James chapter 5, verses 10 and 11, my brethren, take the prophets who spoke in the name of the Lord as an example of suffering and patience. Indeed, we count them blessed to endure. You have heard of the perseverance of Job and seen the end intended by the Lord, that the Lord is very compassionate and merciful. Where Bildad is saying that he's not going to have any legacy, Bildad was wrong. Because Job was not in sin, at least the type of sin that Bildad and his friends are accusing him of. And later on, he did leave a legacy. Later on, he was known for something. I always say this when I think of it uh, at portions of Scripture, and this is this. And there are those watching right now, perhaps you can take this to heart also. Live in such a way, I, you've heard, many of you heard me say this before, live in such a way that at your funeral, people can speak truth about you and not have to make up stories of how good you were when in fact you weren't. There's hardly anything that's more um, difficult than to, to give a funeral for somebody who did not live an honorable life. The very first funeral that I ever did, I was, I think, about 27 or 28 years old. The very first funeral, I've said this before, some of you have heard me, say it, but the very first funeral I ever did was, was a very difficult one because the person being buried, there was nothing good to say about him. There really wasn't. The man had molested his own daughter. The man was an alcoholic. He was, he was, he was a gambler who was lose, lost everything, lost his family, lost everything. I have to tell you, it's very difficult to give a eulogy. You know the words eulogy means good words. And you eulogize the dead. You give good words concerning the dead. You know how difficult it is to speak of someone who had nothing you could say that was good about them? Don't live that way. Don't live that way. Don't live in such a way that people make up stories about you that are not true. Live in such a way that when they speak of you, they speak with a longing for you, a wishing you were still here because you were so loved. Live that way. That's how I try to live. I never want my children, I would never want my children to have to come up and speak concerning me and make up things because dad really wasn't that way. And when they were born, I made it my aim that I would be the kind of father that my children could be proud of. I wanted a legacy. I still do. I want a legacy. And so what Bildad is saying is you, would, you won't have one. Why? Because you're evil. But that's not true because James said, no, you've heard of, the, of what Job has gone through, but how good God was to him at the end. Live in that way. And finally, surely, surely such are the dwellings of the wicked. This is the place of him who does not know God. Surely this is the general manner of those who don't know God. And Job, this is you. That is going to provoke Job once again. And we'll pick that up at verse 1 in chapter 19 when Job responds to the kind words of Bildad.